All right, our lecture today is going to be on modern architecture. And before we jump into modern architecture, we need to see how ancient architecture was first created, which is using the shell system. This means that there's one basic building material that provides both the structural support and the outer covering of the building. This is just like the pyramids being made out of limestone or the Parthenon being made out of marble, the Pantheon made from concrete, and these great Gothic cathedrals, they're made out of stone. One solid building material all the way through. Now with the skeleton and skin system, that's the way modern buildings are constructed. So the skeleton and skin system is where we have a solid core framing. Now this can be wood for most houses, or it could be gigantic I-beams for skyscrapers. That's the core framing material. It's going to support the integrity of the building. And then it's going to be covered by a protective skin, which is usually drywall, plaster, aluminum siding, glass, all of those types of products that, while they don't help support the weight of the building, they do protect the core of the building. And the very first building we're going to look at, this is the very first modern building. This is the Crystal Palace, and it's created by Joseph Paxton. It was in London, and it housed the very first World's Fair in 1851. This is a gigantic structure. It covers 18 acres worth of property. You can see that it's mostly all glass. And one of the things that modern architecture is derived from is that we have new materials being developed all the time. So we have the newly invented cast iron. In this case, it's encased with wood. And that was able to open up the walls to put windows. And we have 900,000 square feet of glass in this structure. It was the very first prefabricated building, and it was built within nine months by unspecialized workers. And even the architect had really never built a building before. He was a landscaper. And so he knew how greenhouses were constructed, and that's what he built is a gigantic greenhouse. That's Joseph Paxton there. He had a background in horticulture, but ended up becoming a politician and a member of parliament for several years. At the gardens of Chatsworth, Paxton experimented with glass and iron in the creation of large greenhouses. And so the Great Conservancy, which you see at the left there, um, kind of shows this. And the techniques learned building the structure is going to be the basis for the Crystal Palace. And I will warn you, I have way too many pictures of the Crystal Palace because I just think it's an incredibly awesome building. And of course, with it being the very first World's Fair, makes it even more special. It was relocated after the fair. And there you can get an idea of how large the structure was. Unfortunately, though, it does not exist anymore. In 1936, it burned down. The wood that was encasing the cast iron caught fire. I don't remember what was inside of it, but it got so hot that the glass melted and there were newspaper reports of molten glass running down the streets. Now, a few years after the Crystal Palace is created, we have the Red House, which was the home of William Morris, the founder of the arts and crafts movement. And this home is definitely not modern. This is Gothic revival. And Again, kind of like when we look at modern art, 
It was not embraced when it was first created. And the same can be said for modern architecture. In fact, William Morris absolutely hated anything that was modern. So it stands in opposition to the Crystal Palace. The next structure we're going to look at, also in Europe, is the Eiffel Tower. And this is created, again, for a World's Fair, this time the Paris Exposition of 1889, and Gustav Eiffel was its creator. The Crystal Palace, or the, uh, excuse me, the Eiffel Tower is the largest man-made structure in the world at that time. 945 feet in height, it nearly doubled the size of the Washington Monument, which was, before this was built, the tallest monument. It was the entranceway to the fair. And Gustav Eiffel, um, before he built this, was a bridge builder. And so you can see how the trusses look very much like the Eiffel Tower on its side. And when we look at both this bridge and the Eiffel Tower, we see it's just the skeleton of the skeleton and skin system. Again, a structure that was not embraced when it was first created. It was only supposed to last the duration of the fair plus another 20 years. But of course, today it is a landmark of Paris and of France. Hitler never touched the Eiffel Tower, never stood foot on it. However, the image of the, at the right of the German soldiers on top of the Eiffel Tower during the Second World War, they had to climb up all the steps to get there. The citizens of Paris dismantled the elevators during the occupation of the Nazi forces. One last building we're going to look at in Europe is the Villa Savoy by Le Corbusier. And earlier on, I told you Joseph Paxton had a background in horticulture. Le Corbusier, he was a watchmaker. During the 1920s and 30s, Europe was known for what's called the international style. And the international style has seven key components. The Villa Savoy has all seven of them. We first look at the Peloti, which are the thin columns you'll see at the base level. They are reminiscent of the ancient Greek columns. And you can kind of see how light and airy that building is. It looks like these thin columns are holding them up. Well, this is what's called a free-floating or non-weight-bearing facade. There's no ornamentation on this building. It's very plain, very geometric. We have a very neutral color. We have ribbon windows along the front there. We have an open floor plan and we have a rooftop garden. So all seven of those components, and I'll go over them one more time. It's not something you'd ever need to memorize for an exam, but you just need to know that they do exist. So we've got the columns at the base level. We've got a free floating or non weight bearing facade, ribbon windows, no ornamentation or lack of ornamentation. Neutral color. We've got an open floor plan, meaning that the walls that are there are movable. And finally, we have that rooftop garden. And there you can kind of see how the model is of how the garden looks, kind of like a, a ship's sail. Not a very energy efficient home. but a very cool home nonetheless. Now we're going to move to America and it's kind of unique to think that as much as America disliked modern art, we didn't really take part in the modern art movement until 1945 at the end of World War II. But we do embrace modern architecture and modern architecture is or has a much better footing in America because of some circumstances, particularly in Chicago. And I'm gonna tell you Chicago is the birthplace for modern architecture. 
Chicago in 1879 burns down for the most part. It gives architects a clean slate in which to work. They also implement a grid-like road pattern. And finally, we don't have any monuments that we're worried about tearing down or damaging or destroying to build these new skyscrapers. So over in Europe, no one's going to be able to bulldoze the Pantheon in order to put up a new building. So Chicago is pretty well open and we have the Marshall Field Wholesale Store. And this is our very first skyscraper. And even though it doesn't look much like a skyscraper or for that matter, a modern building, it absolutely is. This is built exactly like the Crystal Palace. Cast iron, huge spaces of uninterrupted support on the inside of the building. It fills the entire city block, but the architect makes a huge error and on the outside of the building puts this heavy sandstone brick. It weights it down. There is no verticality here. It's just very much cemented to the block on which it sits. It looks very much like the Medici Villa that is off to the right, a building that was built 300 years earlier. It's not going to be for another half a decade before we start to get our standard skyscraper. And this is going to be from Louis Sullivan, who does a lot of work in the Midwest and also in the Upper East Coast. We have a ground floor for retail shops. Up above, we have a mezzanine level, and then we have office space. At the very top of the office space, we have a really cool attic area. And when we zoom in to the building, you'll notice all the ornamentation. And this is one of the keystones of a Louis Sullivan building. He made them beautiful. And he felt that if the building you worked in was beautiful, that you would be a happier employee. You'd be, you know, more productive. And so we've got this great, really cool ornamentation all over. I also included in this presentation the Bayard Conduct building. And this one is just because it's been the most recent in terms of conservation. It's been cleaned, worked on, and with as great as this guy's buildings were, Louis Sullivan today is noted not so much for his buildings, which he is, but for a human resources error. He had an employee a draftsman working for him that he felt did really poor work or was really slow. And that person ended up being Frank Lloyd Wright. So this guy, Louis Sullivan, fires Frank Lloyd Wright, who today, of course, is our most embraced modern architect in America. Frank Lloyd Wright had a really long life and he was born right after the Civil War. These early residential homes um, were done in his 30s and he has very unique uh, styles to them. You can see from the roof itself that it's going to slant down on all sides. It's called a hip roof. Normally in Southern California we have what's called the gable roof where it just slants down on two sides but here it slants down on all four. And by the way all the Frank Lloyd Wright homes I've been into They've all leaked in terms of when it rained. So that may not have been his best talent was constructing roofs. Or it may just have been the age of the building. But Frank Lloyd Wright also was so important in creating the furniture for these homes. Nothing would have existed that would have fit the design of the homes themselves. So he had to create the furniture and we always see a tremendous amount of windows as well because windows are going to let in natural light, keeping artificial light to a minimum. By the early part of the 20th century, he establishes what's called prairie style architecture. And we see that in the Roby House. And the Roby House is just awesome. It sits on a really long, narrow strip of land. Um, 
you think of prairies as being very horizontal and there's definitely a horizontality to this structure. The material quarried from local areas and we also have in the upper left hand corner of this image you can kind of see the roof jutting out over the patio. This is something brand new for the early 1900s where you have steel reinforced concrete. So this home was very, very modern. Frederick C. Roby was the person who commissioned this home. And unfortunately, after he commissioned it, he only lived it here for about, about six months or nine months. And his company, which was bicycle manufacturing, went broke. And so this home was set not only for foreclosure, but for demolition on three separate instances. But today it is on the National Register of Historic Homes, and it's just really cool. The building itself, and this is what makes Frank Lloyd Wright different than other architects, is normally when a building is constructed, we're concerned about the perimeter. We construct the outside walls first and get an idea for the size of the structure and then divide it up into separate rooms. For Frank Lloyd Wright, he starts right here in the living room, uh, and particularly the fireplace, and he builds out from that part. He said that this room, the living room, is the most important, home, important room in the home. And it's a very Japanese sensibility, a very Eastern sensibility. He spent a lot of his early career in Japan rather than in America. Again, a tremendous amount of windows. And he also created the furniture for this home as well. Now, what bothers me the most about modern architecture is our willingness to destroy it. We have this thing about not destroying paintings such as the Mona Lisa. I mean, if that ever got destroyed or damaged, you know, you would not hear the end of it. But when we look at a modern building, like the Larkin building, if it's in our way, we just destroy it. And this was an incredible building. This is a five-story tall fortress with pink mortar in between the bricks. This was the home of the Larkin Soap Company. It's the first building, first commercial building that had an atrium, that had skylights, that had air conditioning, and we just demolish it. Also, the Imperial Hotel, for the most part, is demolished. There was at least one structure saved and relocated. But again, just a massive building. And as I mentioned, Frank Lloyd Wright had a tough time getting started in America. It wasn't going to be until the 1920s where he really can work exclusively in our country. Uh, he spent many years in Japan because that's who was hiring him. Now, he does have a great quote. Tip the world on its side and everything loose will land in Los Angeles. And he did do some buildings here in L.A. The Hollyhock House, for instance, is a really great building that is nearby that you should go and check out if you're in the area. It's just off the 5 Freeway at Hollywood Boulevard. It's in what's called Barnsdale Park. It's on top of the hill there. And you can walk through it. And last time I was there, which was the summer of 2019, they were only charging like $7 to walk through it. It was pretty impressive to and inexpensive to uh, have a good afternoon there. You can kind of see the uh, Griffith Observatory up there on the hill to the right, just to give you an idea of where this is located. The home was commissioned by Alina Barnsdale, who was an oil baroness. And unfortunately, she and Frank Lloyd Wright did not get along. And he kind of did what he wanted to do, which was his temperament. You can see that the along the side of the building there, those abstract forms are abstracted hollyhock flowers. Frank Lloyd Wright's homes are also very well balanced. Also a Japanese influence with the screen in the background. The backs of the chairs, again, that same motif of a hollyhock flower. 
being turned into geometric shapes. This is the library room. And the living room. And this is what the living room looks like currently. Even the furniture symmetrically balanced. But when we get to the 1930s, this is where we have Frank Lloyd Wright's most prolific time period. Um, in the 1930s, he completes 150 commissions, and he's in his 60s. And I don't know about you, I want to be retired by the time I'm in my 60s, and this guy is the total opposite. He's the most active. And Falling Water is his most noteworthy work. It's, it's a fantastic structure. It's out in the woods in Pennsylvania, and sometimes you'll hear this called the Edgar J. Kaufman House. And you can go on tour to it today during the summertime. It's not open during the winter. And Edgar J. Kaufman owned a string of department stores on the East Coast. When he was a kid, this is the place where he and his family would vacation. And what he wanted, and what he told Frank Lloyd Wright, is I just want a summer home. The only stipulation is I want a view of the river. The first set of designs put the home off to the left of the river, and it just didn't appeal to either of the individuals. The second set of plans Frank Lloyd Wright created put the home to the right of the river. And then the third set of plans placed the home right on top. And you can see underneath that lowest shelf we've got a few gigantic I-beams that span the river, and that's what holds the entire structure up. There are six of them total, and during the renovation of just about three or four years ago, they had to reset them, and they had only shifted, in the 80 years this home has been around, they had only shifted about six inches or so. So, very well constructed. The initial price for this home, uh, was offered at $40,000. That's how much Edgar J. Kaufman was willing to pay. However, by the time it was done, it was four times that amount. So Frank Lloyd Wright built this home for $160,000. The renovations that happened a few years ago came in at $11.2 million. Now, a lot of the home, too, is using material native to the landscape gigantic boulders and such. Um, Frank Lloyd Wright built around them to help anchor the home. And with these images, you can see why this is a summer home and not a winter home. It even has its own website, fallingwater.org, which you definitely need to check out. It even has a falling water cam, which you can see what the home looks like. Back in 2015, wasn't too bad. It was very economical to go through the home. And a lot of people, a lot of famous celebrities flock here. Angelina and Brad, also many years ago. This is one of the members of the Rolling Stones and Elijah Wood. And several other celebrities also frequent this place. It does have a Facebook page. And this is a pretty cool page because they're always doing conservation work. During the winter time when falling water was basically snowed in, Edgar J. Kaufman would come out to Palm Springs. And I just wanna show you a few pictures of this home, also built by a famous architect, Richard Neutra, who does a lot of work in Southern California. And this home was very famous in the 1970s, especially, and 80s, for TV programs, would do shoots here. A lot of advertising was done. It did change hands a lot uh, in the early 2000s, selling for as low as $3 million uh, during the recession. The last time, I believe it sold for about $12 million um, just a couple of years ago. Uh, occasionally it is on tour. I'm not sure if the current owner has it on tour, but 
it is in Palm Springs where all the modernist homes are and you can take a lot of tours around that area. You can kind of see here as well, a lot of the walls are nothing more than uh, dividers to open up the home. So a floor, a ceiling, and glass walls for the most part. Now, the last structure we're going to look at is the case study houses. Um, at the end of World War II, we had a huge housing shortage here in Southern California. And we needed huge amounts of homes very quickly. So this was the idea of getting together the most famous architects of the time, people like Charles and Ray Eames, Pierre Koenig, Richard Neutra, and several others, they would create designs for houses that could be mass produced very quickly with inexpensive material and easily gotten material. So we have elements of glass, of steel, of wood in these homes. Unfortunately, we only have 36 designs. 25 of those designs were carried out to a model home phase and that's where the case study house project ends. None of these go out to mass produced homes. But what's really great is in Southern California, we still have about 20 or so of these homes remaining. And for the most part, they look real similar to how they did here. Now these are generally smaller homes and a lot of the owners have added on to them. But the most famous and the one that's still original in all aspects is the case study house number 22. It is also called the stall house as that is the original owners and current owners, which is second generation now. It has a 280 degree view of Los Angeles. You'll see here is just a living room and a kitchen. And then when we pan to the left, we have two bedrooms. There's also two bathrooms in this house, again, kind of on the northern side of the home. And the frontage toward the street, and it is a private road, is aluminum siding. It literally looks like a trailer from the outside. You enter through the carport into the backyard. And again, a lot of movies have been filmed here. It has an extraordinary view. There's nothing else like it. And of course, a lot of cool people hang out there. And if you do go, you definitely have to go at sun at uh, sundown. They do tours here generally twice a week, and they also um, have they will rent it out for private parties. And that's where I'm going to stop our presentation for today, and I look forward to our next one.